rights, platforms, and artificial intelligence. All of these could be subject to separate individual lectures themselves. But what I thought might be practical uh, was to try and focus on specific cases. And I'm very grateful to Anya uh, for putting emphasis on privacy. There is indeed is uh, there is indeed this concern around data. Data can mean loads of things, and it means different things in different regions. Some of the regions, including Central Asia, are still working on understanding how to best collect and process data and whether this European Union's approach to GDPR and data protection is appropriate or maybe the free market approach uh, would be more suitable to local or regional needs. So what I will try, what I will try to do is focus on specific cases. I'll start off with a case that I hope you guys are familiar with. We will look at this ambiguous notion of artificial intelligence. I'll use algorithms as a key to understanding artificial intelligence for the purpose of this brief introduction to what I hope to be a fruitful discussion. And I will try to put in elements of the human rights regime as we understand it in Europe and beyond. As Anya rightfully mentioned, we have the privilege and opportunity to work together uh, to support the European Union's fundamental rights agency. So there will be a human rights law component to this. As already noted, this is meant as an invitation to a broader discussion. So let me start us off with uh, a case that I hope you guys are familiar with. Um, last year, not yesterday, when Facebook, or two days ago, when Facebook was down, but uh, last year we all were puzzled around a decision by a social media platform that was Twitter to ban the ruling president of the United States. Because allegedly of Donald Trump's tweets, there was an insurrection in the uh, uh, Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And effectively, Twitter felt that those tweets could be understood potentially as a violation of their terms of service and decided to ban President Twitter from that, uh, President Trump from their platform. This was not just Twitter, as I'm certain you recall, it was also Facebook. What I'm trying to hint to with this example is the power that platforms hold with regard to setting limits for freedom of expression. I believe that the reason we are discussing this topic here today is that we seem to have shifted from a governmental consensus around limits of free speech to a global rule of platforms and their terms of service to determine what is allowed online and effectively offline. Is such a ban in this case by Twitter a legitimate restriction put on freedom of expression? Is this in accordance with rule of law? That is an interesting question in itself and I will try to start us off looking into that specific case. But please do consider this in the broader scope. I have another very similar example that kept us equally excited a few years back. There was a Danish newspaper that published on the cover a classic award-winning picture of a girl that was running naked from a small village that was burning after an attack with Nepal. This was uh, referred to as the picture of the Nepal girl, not very, um, uh, uh, not very appropriately, but that was sort of the buzzword that kept us excited, as you can see here in 2016, when speaking about the limits of freedom of expression online. Why? Because this front page of a European newspaper was banned from Facebook because of alleged child pornography connotations. It did indeed have a naked child on the cover. Is this appropriate just because it is a historical picture 
um, that reflects a certain period in international history, or if it does contain nudity of a minor, it should be banned, as Facebook very quickly decided. Now, I'm using this example because there is indeed an artificial intelligence component to this. The last decision within a very short period of time, as is usually um, awarded to those um, contracted workers um, operating on behalf of Facebook, was made by a human. There was an individual sitting there and deciding on banning that image within the regular six seconds that he's granted by Facebook. But originally, the content was flagged by an algorithm. It was an algorithm, a piece of artificial intelligence, if you will, that scanned the picture, identified a naked child and flagged it to the human. And the human confirmed, yes, indeed, that is an image of a naked child. We'll ban it. As you might imagine, it wasn't just that European newspaper that was upset with the picture being banned. It was the majority of human rights institutions in Europe and beyond saying, well, this is clearly an um, um, unallowed, a, a disallowed restriction on freedom of expression. So we think about algorithms making suggestions or effectively making decisions instead of humans, on behalf of humans, hopefully right now, helping humans make those decisions um, as artificial intelligence behind platforms. I'm not going to pretend that I have in-depth knowledge on algorithms, but one thing I do know is that they are far from being simply a black box. They are not. They are mathematical formulas that are fed with certain information and that are instructed, consist of a certain process that will effectively lead to content meeting certain crit criteria being banned. There is an entire discussion around uh, algorithmic transparency. We want to make sure that we know what data is fed into the algorithms and what instructions are part of that artificial intelligence that was created by humans and is operated by humans. You could think of this as simply a piece of computer code that we design and we keep operational rather than something very new, novel, and straight from a science fiction um, uh, novel. What we are thinking about when we say artificial intelligence, we are thinking about an algorithm, a piece of software that is designed by humans and for humans. The way in which it is designed effectively impacts our human rights. I'm going to use this example to continue to hopefully some conclusions. The Facebook algorithm, I'm just going to use that because Facebook is so big and because there is so much debate around their algorithm to manage content, was not created in a day. They are very transparent when it comes to the history of the algorithm. You can see here um, a review of how the Facebook algorithm, the mystical Facebook algorithm, was created. It was a step-by-step -step process which allowed one US company to collect large amounts of data. Now, in Europe, we tend to think about data as personal and non-personal data, a concept that is alien in the US. And our friends and colleagues in the US argue that that is the root of uh, e-commerce that was originated stateside. The data, the majority of data that was collected by Facebook was used as a pillar of their business model. They started aggregating it, profiling users to better meet their needs. The ads that you see on that specific social platform are tailored to what you expect to see. They just wanted to give you a product that would keep you engaged and they were very successful in doing so. Clearly, they used computer code to facilitate 
that aim. Uh, you can see here again an ex explanation of how the Facebook algorithm works, how artificial intelligence is used to keep you engaged with social media platforms. So the inventory section is the one where the data is collected, all kinds of data, not just what we view in Europe as personal data, but for Facebook, there originally wasn't even that distinction. Then the artificial intelligence steps in and automatically aggregates the data it has to feed your news uh, uh, timeline with information that you will find relevant and engaging, keeping you occupied. And effectively, by the deployment of this artificial intelligence, your newsfeed is unique, unlike anyone else's, because it is tailored to what Facebook sees as your needs. I'm not going to go into details, but if you are interested in how this entire model works, there is a really, really engaging documentary about one just happens to be European academic who was so concerned about this business model. He was trying to sue Facebook here in Europe because of data privacy concerns. Um, effectively, we have a global platform that operates based on terms of service and sets a universal standard for freedom of expression, data collection, privacy, um, and other fundamental uh, human freedoms and obligations. Uh, the major concern with this business model, as already noted, was not just freedom of expression, but here in Europe, it was predominantly privacy. Facebook was listening in, has been listening in, and they are trying to make this global platform um, compliant with the rule of law or what we would expect to be the rule of law. Um, they have set up an oversight board, a fascinating endeavor, relatively new, relatively fresh, sort of an international court, an oversight board which decides upon individual complaints. If you have a human rights concern about the way Facebook is acting towards your data, about their freedom of expression related policies, about your controversial post being blocked or taken down, you can file a complaint. And this quasi-universal court, by private ordering, will decide on your case. I encourage you to look into the composition of the oversight award, their rules of procedure. We might just be witnessing the very first private international court in operation. Is everyone happy with the way that Facebook handled this? Does setting up an oversight board solve our problems? Well, I'm certain you can expect the answer. It does not. Just as much as there is applause from predominantly business for the oversight board, there is concern from human rights activists saying, well, why would a private US company set up an international court to decide on the limits of free expression for all worldwide users? Who are these 12, 20 people uh, who are selected to decide? I'm going to check the chat message. I know you're seeing my screen. Yes, thank you. I will come back to the chat with uh, the comments. Thank you very much for sharing these. Um, so we seem to have this private court set up by Facebook, which by far does not attend to all the challenges. You can see here the competition, um, a real Facebook oversight board set up by those contesting uh, this notion as a threat to human rights law as we have known it thus far. It seems, therefore, as if setting up this court doesn't really solve our problems and is not the appropriate way to oversee platforms and artificial intelligence, including its design. As already noted, here in Europe, we tend to think about data through the prism of personal data. I put emphasis on Europe because we have this ambiguous GDPR that I will speak to more in the following slide. 
But before I do, just let me make sure that we're all on the same page when looking at privacy and personal data. Privacy is a human right. You will find it in every single human rights treaty that has ever been signed by states. And it is a part of customary human rights law. Because it is ambiguous, because it is challenging to put our finger on where privacy ends and the rights of others begin, different countries, different organizations, including the OECD, have come up with the notion of personal data. We have a precise definition, we have a list of safeguards, we have rights and obligations that come with personal data. We use personal data as a tool to protect privacy. These two notions are not uh, synonymous, but they do strongly complement one another. I'm going to use personal data to highlight why private ruling over the global uh, community of users might not be sufficient. Um, personal data in Europe right now fundamentally means GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. It is not new in the EU, the first um, directive we've had on personal data protection needed to be replaced with its coming into force in 1995. One of the reasons why we did introduce GDPR was Facebook, or more generally speaking, companies outside the EU, which we could not oblige to abide by the data protection principles. One of the key aspects of GDPR is its transboundary effect. The European Union, the European Commission, the Parliament wanted to enforce personal data protection outside the EU through GDPR. The concept of personal uh, data did not change much. We have the same definition in the GDPR we've had for over 20 years. One of the pivotal points, however, was this transboundary effect, where we are trying to ensure that whatever algorithm or artificial intelligence is created outside the EU is compliant with personal data protection. We thought it was important, particularly because many people in Europe have been using um, outside services for uh, information or for entertainment purposes. There is the so-called Brussels effect. States outside Europe are looking at this GDPR model and trying to figure out if it is appropriate to their needs. Central Asia definitely is one of the regions where this debate is going on. In Europe, the Commission, the European Commission is arguing, well, we are trying to protect the little people. We look at GDPR as an element of consumer protection. Your data should belong to you and you should have the right to decide what happens with it. And that's all we're trying to do. I am certain you have looked into GDPR in other human rights related courses. So just as a reminder, it comes with a comprehensive set of rights and obligations. You have the right to know what happens with your data. The GDPR was advertised with a right to be forgotten. You have a right to request for your data to be deleted from all artificial intelligence design where it might have fallen into. There are fines upon companies who fail to recognize the privacy by design principle. So it is a very detailed set of obligations. The Brussels effect means that many states and also many private companies have implemented these principles into their policies. Not all companies and not all regions. I would argue that the most eager debate right now between the human rights focused policy and the open economy focused policy, if you will, is going on in Africa where the next billion of internet users will likely uh, arise. So we are in the middle of a very interesting discussion 
which should have priority in artificial intelligence design. Is it the rights of an individual like privacy or is it rather the economic interest of the society supported by open access to all categories of data? Now, with Anya and myself serving on the scientific committee of the Fundamental Rights Agency, I do not need to emphasize which side we would take in this debate. I personally strongly feel that individual rights are important and they should be put at the top of the list for any artificial intelligence um, commissioned design, any design that comes with software. But I'm more than happy to see that debated as we progress. So this is just to speak of privacy. Um, one of the reasons we've had GDPR is because the EU was unable to communicate with the US on how to best protect individuals. We've had the privacy shield, we've had the safe harbor principles, and they all failed. We were unable to come to a consensus on how to keep the US business model compliant with the European understanding of personal data protection. And this is the latest unfolding that you can see here with the so-called Schrems II case, where once again, a young Austrian gentleman has proven the European Commission and the US Trade Department wrong in their understanding of how data might want to flow across the Atlantic. Um, the GDPR seems to, in a way, solve that puzzle, assumed we are able to enforce the accountability norms that are a part of this. But that's not where the data privacy discussion ends. We are talking here about private companies, platforms, and their artificial intelligence. But there is also a cyber espionage threat to this. I'm certain you have heard about an Israeli designed Pegasus software that is commissioned by governments who want to make sure that they have access to private communications of individuals within their jurisdiction. And they are not the first ones to do so. The NSA scandal, the Snowden revelations proved once again that artificial intelligence and its design can also be used by governments to collect information or to restrict access to certain content. So when we speak about human rights and artificial intelligence design, we must keep in mind not just the private parties like Facebook, but also artificial intelligence commissioned and used by governments for their purposes. How are we doing on the global scale? I told you that there is this debate between privacy protection through personal data and keeping the economies open. Data-based economies are thriving in the regions here marked in white. This is a map that uh, a good friend and colleague, David Benisar, updates regularly as part of his engagement with Privacy International. Uh, he tries to, in simple terms, emphasize which regions, which countries have privacy and data protection laws and which tend to uh, opt for the open market uh, um, ideology. You can see here clearly a war going on uh, with uh, Central Asian states, with uh, the US opting for the open uh, economical model and Europe, uh, Canada, for example, forever more countries in South America following the uh, GDPR model than Brussels spillover effects, if you will. But this is a map that is produced by an individual working with Privacy International. If you compare this map with one produced by a US company, you will see that the privacy protections in the US are being viewed as fully compliant with, for example, the Canadian model that is very close to the GDPR indeed. So when we look at data protection and privacy, there are quite a few opinions on the same provisions of international law that you guys have been discussing in your classes, in your courses. It's the same 
uh, a black letter law that's being interpreted in different terms around the world. Trying to come to a conclusion, there are a few basic controversies when we look at human rights and platforms or artificial intelligence design. We've looked at freedom of speech and expectations coming from national law. We've looked in depth into privacy and security, that difficult balancing exercise that states are trying to take upon themselves. We haven't touched upon a few other issues that I just want to flag here, and I have them on this one slide. There is this concern around intellectual property protection. I want to speak a little bit more on that, so I have two more slides on this very specific example. But there is this controversy between the right to knowledge and intellectual property protection. I have the right to access content online, but then there are the authors who want to have their rights secured and protected. Uh, we haven't touched upon jurisdiction. Where does state control end? We haven't looked uh, at online work. Is this still work in the social security law terms? Or is this just a contract and we're all freelancers? Is this something that should be regulated as well? And finally, there is this divide between those who have access to ICPs and those who do not. We seem to be forgetting roughly 50% of individuals who are not online and who are not yet um, using social platforms, for example. Are they to have a voice in this discussion or will they have to live with the choices that we make? Just to leave you with some food for thought, let me emphasize that on one hand, human rights law sees freedom of expression as including your right to access knowledge, to access information. And there shouldn't be barriers put to that right. On the other hand, uh, property is protected as a human right, and that arguably includes intellectual property. You have the right to enjoy the fruits of others' labor, whereas your work is to be protected. We seem to be debating this online, also in the design of artificial intelligence forevermore. This is a lovely young gentleman who literally put his life on the line to protect access to information online. This is Aaron Schwartz, one of the creators of the Creative Commons community, who uploaded a large number of copyrighted materials online for people in developing countries to be able to access. Uh, he was prosecuted in the United States and he didn't wait for the court decision, which could have been um, quite burdensome, around 20 years of imprisonment and committed suicide. So you could see how intense this debate is. And I'm mentioning this because right now in Europe, there is a discussion around what is called the Digital Services Act package that will oblige platforms to disable access to any content that raises copyright concerns. The notion of copyright is challenging, especially when we look at fair use. Europe has made its choice and is advancing steps to protect intellectual property online, including through algorithms that will scan your content and flag it should it be copyright in compliant. You can see the explanation behind the Digital Services Act. The European Commission wants to keep consumers safe, also from counterfeit goods or illicit content that violates copyright. But that is another interesting aspect to designing artificial intelligence. How far should we go in detecting content that is illicit, not on relatively consensual topics like child pornography, no one wants to have that online, but copyright protection follows suit and there is much less consensus around what we understand as copyright protection. There is one international treaty that deals with all of these, and that is the Budapest Convention from the Council of Europe. It includes the broad range of all of these topics that we just covered. So I'm going to leave you with this one. 
Um, if you guys do have questions around the Budapest Convention, I'm happy to answer these. Just let me know that it's a treaty that is open to all states, also outside Europe or the Council of Europe. And it seems as if this is the best uh, consensus we have reached thus far around human rights and platforms. I'm going to stop here. I'm almost on time, Anya. I'm looking at the clock. I'm almost on time. I hope you can bear with me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, look into the chat and hopefully answer some questions or listen to your opinions, which would be even better. Thank you.